said old vile bodies. Uh, I thought you said you only had five hours on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> only got three hours and seven minutes. Better not use it all. <laughs> I gotta say something for tomorrow. Yeah, it's, been, it's hard to believe it's been a year since I was here last. And uh, we're talking about the virus, why folks aren't here that were here last year, but I think Paul's just trying to be nice. They probably just remember me from last year. <laughs> No, I'm kidding around. But we, you know, <clears throat> we got to just, there's a lot of things we can't control a whole lot. What we can control is our reaction. And contentment is in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Not in circumstances. Not in people's reaction, whether it be good or bad. It's just Jesus Christ. Never changes. Paul, at the end of his ministry, think how broke down he was physically, emotionally, spiritually. But he didn't die a bitter old man. He died in victory. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. You know, and it's a fight. So there's nothing worth doing more than what we're doing in Amen. standing for the truth. Amen. Having done all to stand. We all love to see results and feel like we're making progress. But if you can put on the whole armor of God and simply stand in these days we're in, don't go backwards. Stand strong in the Lord. And fight the good fight. And the Lord's well pleased. And I do believe the Lord uses us more than we realize. If we're getting the word out, planting and watering, planting and watering, he uses it, no doubt about it. We don't always see it. But he uses it nonetheless. What a day it'll be at the judgment seat of Christ when everything is known. Um, there's going to be some negativity, but I believe there's also going to be some great rejoicing too. You know, so I appreciate Paul's faithfulness. He's a good friend, and Stephen's a good friend. I've enjoyed greatly being over there with them, with their folks, and then the fellowship with them. And I wish my family could be here. You know, we planned in May to come up. My daughter was supposed to be in, I don't know what town it was, about an hour from here. They were having some event. Their horse team that she's on was supposed to ride. They have a drill team. They do things and travel. And, but uh, that, everything was getting canceled, you know. And so, but we're able to work it out to uh, at least get back up here. And I'm glad we did because I hate to tell I hate to tell you this, but if they're doing what, what they're doing right now in August, what's going to be going on in September, October, you know, November first, November second? Right? We'll see. They're desperate. They're pulling out all the stops, aren't they? Yeah. I'm, I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying there's not a virus. Good night. There's tons of viruses. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of viruses. It's a COVID-19. And they're like COVID-1, COVID-2, COVID. No, it was the 19 because of the year. Is that what it is? I thought maybe it was 19 different viruses. Yeah. Who knows? There's a lot of viruses. That's not the problem. The problem is the reaction. The problem is how they're using it. The problem is... Well, you know what the problem is, and that's not what I came to preach on. So Colossians chapter 1 is where we'll start. I'm going to try to do a series, and I hope you'll come back if you can tomorrow night. And Wednesday night takes three to thrive, the Bible says. But anyway, <laughs> that's from the old days there. Um, kind of a short series. I think that the three messages will build on each other. That's what I'm hoping. I <laughs> hope it works out that way by the time we're done. And these are things that I have personally struggled with. And I believe the Lord's ministered to my heart through his word. And you know what true ministry is? You don't have anything to minister to others till God first ministers to you. Right. So as God ministers to you, then he wants to minister through you. There's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. So if I've struggled with these things, I'm pretty confident you have too. So hopefully it'll be a help and encouragement. And uh, I thought about covering the basics of right division because I'm not sure what all your pastor's been talking about. No, I, I don't, I've never heard anybody preach it any better than Brother Lucas preaches it. You know? So I'm not going to improve anything or do anything. But here's the thing about having meetings. When I heard him preach last night, I said, why am I up here? He should preach his own meeting. <laughs> 
But the thing about it is why we have him come. And other, it, when you hear from someone else, it's an encouragement. <coughs> there's other nuts out there, you know? Right. Other people that are like-minded. And sometimes it's just, you know, it's just a great thing to have that fellowship. And it's not about preacher competition. That's all carnal nonsense when you start right. measuring. Pre By the way, this the, the YouTube groupie thing is just as carnal <laughs> as all get out, you know? <laughs> Uh, hey, you, you have a lot of that going on with folks. <laughs> well, this is my, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. I'm yeah. of, well, haven't you read 1 Corinthians? Yeah. Paul said we're nothing. Hey, Amen. You know, all we do is plant and water. It's God that gives the increase. Uh -huh. yeah. We're laborers. It's God's field. We're builders. It's God's temple. We're stewards. It's God's mysteries. God gets all the glory. Amen. Oh, Apollos, he's eloquent. He's my man. I like that. Yeah. He has a silver tongue, you know. <laughs> Paul, his speech is contemptible, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Who cares? It's the word of God that matters, right? Yeah. All right. I, uh, hey, so let's go. Uh, we'll get to Colossians 1 eventually. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure we're all familiar. Now, we start now, okay? 7 something. <laughs> 7, 12. Uh, you got Gary's sign for me? Dad's. I think Dad's going to have to control it. <laughs> yeah, right there. <laughs> now, are you going to get your uh, your candy out and do the wrapper like he does, too? <laughs> 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 if Gary watches this later, I want to know I hear that whenever I watch the message. I'll get your daughter here. So she says that was the first 10 minutes. The candy man. <laughs> Isn't it nice just to be yourself and enjoy the Lord and just get in the Word of God and yeah. without all the formal hoopla of the religious yeah. world? Yeah. You know? Amen. All right, I'm sure you're familiar with the term hyper-dispensationalism. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? <laughs> Doesn't it sound bad? I mean, it's, it's like a disease. We need to pray for him. He's got a case of hyper-dispensation. <laughs> the reason why it's so scary is because it's such a big word, right? It's got a lot of syllables. But it's not difficult to understand. Uh, the Greek prefix hyper just means excessive and going beyond what is right and what is acceptable. Some people prefer the Latin prefix of ultra, right? Hyper-dispensationalism, ultra dis And sometimes they try to distinguish as though those are two different things. It just depends on who you're hearing say that, that word gets hurled around quite a bit. Typically, most of the time, it's used by people who are talking about someone who's more dispensational than they are. Right. If you go beyond them, then you're simply a hyper-dispensationalist. That's just the way it works. A lot of people, though, I think use the word that don't even know what it is. They just heard somebody else use it. I have a, in my office, I have a book someone gave me one time by John R. Rice, and, and he's got... <laughs> He's got all the heresies he's had to deal with. He's got, you know, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness. And he has hyper-dispensationalism on there. Isn't that nice? He puts them in the same category with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, you know. Because, uh, you know, John R. Rice, I'm sure he loved the Lord and all that, but he couldn't rightly buy a Kit Kat bar, you know. He thought the body of Christ started with Adam. So, I mean... If you think the body of Christ starts with Adam, everybody's a hyper-dispensationalist from your standpoint. You know? Oh, man. So, uh, dispensationalism, okay? Obviously, that's God's method of Bible study. John Nelson Darby did not invent it. That's a lie. It's in the Word of God. Study and show thyself approved unto God, a workman that is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. That's the Word of God, the key to Bible study. It's the divine method of Bible study. We understand that. Really, it's just the understanding that although God doesn't change in His person, He does change in His dealings with man throughout the ages as He right. progressively reveals more truth. And those that revelation brings about some changes in His dealings. It's very simple. It's not that complicated once you understand what a dispensation is and the basics of rightly dividing. But so the, the problem though is man is always prone to extremes. And so it is certainly possible to go to unscriptural extremes and it is possible to be guilty of wrongly dividing the word of truth. 
When you ignore the divisions God put in His Word. See, right in the dividing, simply acknowledging the divisions God put in His Word. They're there. They're right there. Just acknowledge it. Maintain it in your Bible study. But when you ignore them, you're not rightly dividing the Word of truth. When you invent divisions that are not there, you're wrongly dividing. Some people ignore God's division. Some people put more in there than God did. You know, and so it's, it's wrong. It's wrongly dividing the word of truth. But, of course, uh, the issue of when you believe this present dispensation began is typically one of the main ways people judge whether or not they think someone's a hyper-dispensationalist. That's typically the main way. And the problem is that what may seem hyper, in other words, excessive and going beyond what's right, in comparison to your traditional view, may not be hyper at all in the Word of God. Right, yeah. Paul said, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Prove it in the Word of God. But people say, well, that's beyond me. That's beyond what I see. That's beyond what I believe. So that must be wrong. That is hyper-dispensationalism. The issue is not what is hyper compared to someone's view. The issue is, is it hyper according to the Word of God? That's the issue. Now, I believe that this present dispensation began with Paul's salvation and ministry. And there are many, what they call classical dispensationalists, you know. We're hyper, they're classical. You know, isn't that something? They're, they're normal. They're normative. They call them, I'm a normative. You're a hyper, you know. Yeah. Uh, but they would say, well, that, you know, the body of Christ obviously started in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. Because the Holy Ghost was poured out. There's a church there. There it is. <laughs> right? It's that simple, right? And so they say, Acts 2. Now, if you go beyond Acts 2, and by the way, the book of Acts, let me just say this, the, the purpose of the book of Acts is not to tell you when the body of Christ started. Yeah. So enough of this chapter stuff. That's not why the book of Acts was written. It's a transitional book. It's a historical book. If you want to understand when the body of Christ started, you get it from Paul's epistles. Amen. That's the That's issue. Right. Okay? And so, but they say, well, you're a hyper because you, and of course, oh, you got people that, and I was actually one who said, it started in Matthew 10 when Jesus called out his disciples. And I remember we had, a, in our Bible college, we had a foreign student who was going around telling everybody it started in Acts chapter 2. And I got all over him. I said, you idiot. You know, what, what do you people believe over there in India anyway? Don't you understand that Jesus called out, called out, church, called out his disciples in uh, Matthew chapter 10? You know, don't you? And so, but here I am. I'm way. <laughs> how things change, you know. Now that guy thinks I'm a hyper dispensationalist. But Matthew 10, they say, well, you Acts 2 guys. Acts 2 says, oh, you Acts 9 guys. Acts 9 says, what is with these Acts 18 guys? Acts 18, oh, I forgot Acts 13. Acts 13 says, what's with the Acts, 8, Acts 18? You Acts 28 and on it goes, right? Now, uh, it, so that's how that thing kind of works. But, of course, a biblical dispensation, and it's a Bible word four times used by Paul by inspiration of God, is just a dispensing of divine revelation bringing about significant changes in how God has dealt with man. How can, how can a dispensation begin before the revelations that make it a distinct dispensation are dispensed? Yeah, amen. Well, what it is is the body was there, but nobody knew it. Yeah. Right? You heard that one. Well, the dis what marks the beginning of a dispensation is God dispensing the revelation to make that change, right? So a dispensation is a dispensing of divine revelation. Colossians 1, we finally got here, verse 24. And of course, in the context, there's a twofold ministry of Paul. God sent him to every creature with the gospel, the grace of God, and to the church with the revelation of the mystery. And he's talking about this two twofold ministry here in the context. Verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul filled it up, not Peter, not James, not John. Paul suffered for this information. Yeah. Peter, James, and John suffered, but not for the same information Paul was suffering for. Right. You understand that? Now, Christ suffered to accomplish our salvation. Nothing could be added to that. 
But Paul suffered to make it known. Yeah. Christ is not going to suffer anymore. So once he revealed his message to Paul, Paul suffered to get that message out and to make it known. And he said, where have I made a minister? According to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Okay, everything else outside of Paul's epistles has to do with the prophetic kingdom program of Israel. Yeah. This is something very distinct given to Paul this secret plan before the world began but kept, kept hidden in God till revealed to Paul. Now that's made known. That fulfills the word of God. So therefore, if Paul completed, fulfilled me, complete the word of God, then it would make sense. 2 Timothy is actually the last book written. Amen. The Bible's not arranged chronologically. It's arranged dispensationally. 2 Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. Amen. Would that make sense to put that in the last book? And by the way, the word inspiration occurs twice in the Bible. The first reference is in the first book ever written, the book of Job. Job 32, 8. There's a spirit of man, the inspiration of the Almighty, giving them understanding. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 16, the last book, there's the book ends. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. You want to understand <laughs> biblical inspiration, you've got to study those two references, right? Amen. Wow. And so not only that, not only the all scripture given by inspiration of God, but now that it's all been revealed, that would make sense that 2 Timothy would be where God said, rightly dividing the word of truth, now that it's all made known. Do you understand that? So um, he said, verse 26, even the mystery. All right, so he said the dispensation of God. What is it? Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations. But now is made manifest Amen. to his saints, now in this present age, to whom God would make known was the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, Gentiles, without Israel, one new man. We have a hope to be glorified with him, to reign in heavenly places. Show me that in the Old Testament if you would. Amen. Not there. You understand all that. I'm trying to go somewhere with all this. Just hang with me. So you, I don't have to elaborate. Paul was preaching on this last night. But I'm just starting here. We understand that we're living in the dispensation, the mystery plan by God before the world began, but kept secret until it was first revealed to the Apostle Paul. And so what took place in Acts chapter 2 was all according to prophecy. Yeah. That's why Peter said this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Right. Well, if everything in Acts 2 is prophecy and we're in a, a dispensation that's a mystery... How are you going to start the dispensation of the mystery during the times of prophecy? That's right. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth, and the main divisions, prophecy and mystery. Acts 3.21, spoken by all the prophets, you know, since the world began. Romans 16.25, secret since the world began. But you know what? The gospel that we must believe in order to become a member of the body of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, revealed to Paul by Christ from heaven, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that the moment you trust Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection without works, totally the grace of God, the moment you believe that message, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. Amen. You understand, Paul said in Ephesians 3, 6 about the body, it's by the gospel. He said by the gospel. You get in the body by what gospel? Paul said... The gospel he received, you received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. How are you going to get, how can you begin the body of Christ before the gospel you must believe to get in the body of Christ is, is even revealed? That's right. Amen. In Acts 2, it's a, it's a prophesied baptism with the Holy Ghost for power. Christ is the baptizer. First Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit, the spirit's the baptizer, we're all baptized in one body, baptized into Christ for salvation. Mm -hmm. It's a mystery. Yeah. These things are not the same, and you understand that. And so that's why I believe, in a nutshell, I could say more, like for an example, Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, right? That was the message. Is that the gospel of the grace of God? Yeah. Not at all. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Yeah. You couldn't preach the gospel of the kingdom without water baptism. You can't preach the gospel of the grace of God with it. Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. And so there's a number of reasons that I can go on and on. And I know you already know this, but there's a reason why scripturally we believe when this dispensation began and so forth. But you have to understand 
that hyper-dispensationalism is actually a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it actually is a problem. Because any extreme position causes trouble, causes problem. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And it's unhealthy. And it has serious doctrinal and practical ramifications. When you go beyond the Word of God and how you divide the Bible, it's a dead end street. I mean, there are consequences to that. So you say, well, what is hyper dispensationalism? Well, there is a position known as the Acts 28 position, and it is hyper dispensationalism. And I'm not just saying that because it's beyond me. I'm saying that because I can prove it from the Word of God, because they say the body of Christ couldn't have started until Acts 28. I'm not going to stop and deal with all that. It's not, actually not my message right now. But I'm just pointing it out that, you know, the fact that Paul wrote about the mystery of the body of Christ in Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians. He writes about it during the book of Acts, before Acts 28. It's pretty simple to see they've gone beyond the word of God and trying to start the... And so what happens is they have to have two bodies of Christ. What happens is now they have two raptures, a low calling and a high calling. And, and it gets really fouled up when you, when you really get into that mess. I looked into it, and uh, I'm not afraid of anything. I want to study everything with an open heart and open Bible. And I looked into that thing and tried to prove it by the Scripture, and I found problem after problem after problem. I do have a couple of messages somewhere on our, in our Q&A series on the Acts 28 position. I intend to give it a more thorough treatment sometime, hopefully in the near future, but I don't think we have any Acts 28ers in here besides Paul, so I don't know why I'm even... No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's a joke, okay? Uh, you know, I, I mentioned it for a reason, okay? I'm, I'm trying to get somewhere. I haven't got there yet, so just pray for me about that. But Satan uses the Acts 28 position to scare people away from that's right division. Yeah. Yeah. Because these guys, man, the stuff they teach... Oh, Charles Welch, uh, he was really the main guy. Okay. Bullinger flirted around with it. Okay. Bullinger was mid-Acts, almost his whole ministry. He started messing around with the Acts 28 stuff in 1906. He died in 1913. I think if he would have lived longer and studied it further, he would have saw where it was leading. Welch picked up the ball as a young man, took it and ran it way out of bounds. And Welch, if you want to understand Acts 28, you really get And Welch has a lot of material. You can read it. I've read a lot of it. <laughs> Welch has got, in this age, Charles Welch teaches there are John 3.16 believers that are sheep believers that are saved but not in the body of Christ. Because yeah. you can't be in the body of Christ unless you know what Charles Welch, Welch thought he did. You see, so what happens is some of these guys, they start getting these little clicks and schisms. And they have, they're so elite. I'm so super spiritual. And I'm not going to, I could list several groups within the so-called grace movement that think they're better than everybody, and all they're doing is splitting the body of Christ, practically speaking, and it's not of God. <coughs> they come up with these doctrines that they think set them apart as though they're better than other members of the body of Christ. That's a real problem. Yeah. Guess what? Every movement has its problem. Why? Because every movement has men in it. Yeah. Right. And flesh is flesh, whether it's Baptist or whether it's charismatic or whether it's dispensational. Yeah. And so the fact is... If you look at the history and, and you understand, can I just, just, just say this briefly? The Acts 28 position, the, really what it is, it's a lazy man's approach to the book of Acts. Yeah. You say, boy, there's a lot of stuff going on here in the book of Acts. Why is Paul going to the Jew first? Why is he taking a vow? Why, why this? Why that? I'll tell you what, that was another dispensation. So forget, that, that's an easy way out of the transition period. That's an easy way out of some things. And they just try to put it all in a previous dispensation. But it does not work. It will not work. And by the way, it can't work unless you're a Bible corrector. Yeah. You right. can't be Acts 28 and know what you're talking about unless you start correcting the King James Bible. Because you can't prove it without changing some words in the King James Bible. And I know what I'm talking about. I've, I've tried to. There's some guys that right now, they're going that direction. And I try to tell them, listen. You say you believe a King James Bible. You can't hold to that position and believe a King James Bible. You're going to have to start messing with the text if you're going to follow that through. Oh, oh, you're going to be the first one, are you? You know, That's how proud people can get. It won't work. Okay? And be, you say, 
What's so dangerous? Because it's an extreme doctrine, guess what it leads to? More extremes. Acts, they're Acts 28ers. They teach universal reconciliation. Everybody's saved in the end. They teach, there's some that teach that. A lot of them teach no hell. A lot of them teach a soul sleep type of doctrine. Some of them teach polygamy. Today. For today. <laughs> polygamy. How does that, you say, what's that got to do with Acts 28? I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but what it is, what it is is that because you're so extreme, it leads you to be extreme in a lot of other areas. You see what I'm saying? At 11, 11 is the whole lump. Now, my purpose is really not to get into all of that doctrinal hyperdispensationalism. What I want to talk about is practical hyperdispensationalism. It's possible to not be hyper in our doctrine, but be hyper in how we act about it. So, no matter how much we grow spiritually, We'll never apprehend in this life. And therefore, you know what we're always going to stand in need of? Reproof and rebuke. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine, right? But the mad preachers, the mid-acts dispensationalists, I hate tags, all this stuff, you know. Come on, folks. I mean, we're, we're Bible-believing Christians. We're in the body of Christ. Let's use biblical language. Are you a mad? Yeah, I'm getting mad at you. You're getting on my nerves. You know? I get cranky sometimes. You know? I, I came out of all that labeling and all that camp stuff and all of that, that kind of... I, don't want, I didn't come out of that and go back into it. Yeah. I love freedom. I love liberty. And I just want to believe this Bible. And I just want to serve the Lord. You, you see, people, they go in one, they come out of one thing and go right into another thing. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I'm not, these, some of these people, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but they lament the denominationalism, but they are so denominational in their attitude. Yeah. Amen. You can't fellowship with somebody not as enlightened, enlightened as we are. <laughs> you know, they don't even know the mystery. <laughs> Hey, Paul says, Paul says Mark can avoid him. Yeah, let me, let me finish my message. How about that? I'm going somewhere. And I think you need it. I hear you. I hear All right. You. I hope you do. Okay. This is stuff we need. Okay? Because this we are our own biggest problem. Right? We push more people away. Then we bring in, and then we complain about nobody. Want. We're, we blame, this victim's mentality is everywhere. It's every, everybody's a victim. When do we take responsibility for our actions? Right? When do we take responsibility? It's always everybody else's fault. But this is stuff that we need to hear. I didn't come to preach to everybody out there. I came to preach to us sitting right here. And what I'm trying to say is the mad preachers, they're very good about calling everybody out. Oh, everybody's wrong. Everybody's wrong. But then you point out an error in their own walk and, they can't, and their own life. They can't handle it. You know what that proves? They're full of pride. Amen. They can't take admonition. They can't take rebuke. I, don't, I, I appreciate when somebody loves me enough to tell me the truth and it hurts. Because I need it. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Amen. Amen. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Right. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And so what I'm saying is, we, a lot of time, and I've been guilty of it. That's why I'm preaching this. I know what I'm talking about. We can get so good about calling everything out and calling everybody out, but we can't even walk with God. We can't even lead our family. We can't even lead our church. And that's a problem. So I'm preaching to us tonight if you haven't figured that out yet. And, and, and let me encourage you. Let me, I'm trying to be as loving as I know how to be. It is love that motivates me to preach the word. I told you in the beginning of this that this is stuff that I've had to deal with. And, I'm, and the folks not only in this room, I am not preaching for YouTube, but if Paul does end up putting this message on YouTube, I get, people have probably already clicked off by now. Okay, But if, the, if you haven't, is that the camera? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. If you haven't clicked off, try to watch the whole thing. Okay? 
Because the inability to receive admonition is a mark of immaturity. Sure. That's right. You know, if you can't be taught anything, you can't ever be corrected on anything, yeah. you're not as spiritual as you think you are. Amen. Yeah. In fact, let me show you something. I want to really make somebody mad now. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5. Because what the writer of Hebrews says here, Paul says something similar, but I want to point something out real quick. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. The meat of the word, right? Now, what is, is that just knowing the meat? The meat of the word. You got the milk of the word, those simpler. And Paul says the same thing, right? 1 Corinthians 3. The milk of the words, the simpler, more introductory things. It, you ought to get built up in the milk to handle the meat. You ought to grow to be, you can handle the meat of the word, the deeper things. But watch this. Strong meat belong with them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The spiritual man judgeth all things. Spiritual discernment. It's not just because you, you heard somebody give some interesting doctrine and you can simply say, I've heard that. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. And you, you can verbalize what you've heard, but do you have spiritual discernment? And do you use it in how you live? I've, I've told the people, I, I'm, not try, I'm not trying to be critical because I'm not, I'm not apprehended. But there are people, man, they can, they can say things that they've heard other people teach. But then when you listen to them for a little while, you realize these people don't even know the basics between right and wrong. Yeah. That's, that's something's missing there. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so that's what I'm trying to get at. All right, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. All right, I'm going to get happy now, okay? I'm happy in the Lord. This is the day which the Lord hath made. <laughs> I said that the other day. I was talking about the day of the Lord. And in Psalm 118, in the context, the day of the Lord, uh, this is the day which, this day we're living in right now, the Lord didn't make it. If the Lord made this day, it'd be going a lot better than this, okay? <laughs> now, I'm not talking, but you get what I'm saying. The day of the Lord. Now, and if you study Psalm 118 and you look at what's going on there, it's talking about the day of the Lord. But anyway, a dear lady in our church came to me later and said, I always, I always use the verse that way. I said, you can use it that way. You can get up. Because I said, you know, you got people that devotionalize it. And they get up in the morning early and say, this is the day which the Lord hath. I said, I hate people like that, you know. <laughs> I was just being, you know, sarcastic and kidding around. But she kind of took it personally. But then, then she said she understood and everything's fine, so. Philippians 4, verse 5. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord's at hand. Amen and amen. The Lord's at hand. Let your moderation. That's the only time the word moderation is found in the King James Bible, I think. Right? Am I right? Well, it is basically moderation is the avoidance of excess or extremes. And... The bottom line is it's a good testimony to live a balanced Christian life without going to one extreme or the other. It's not easy. When we talk about balance, it's not easy because guess what? The flesh, I would come down here, but I'm afraid I couldn't get back up there. <laughs> got a little bit of a weakness here in the back area. The flesh is prone to extremes, right? So balance in the Christian life is very difficult. And if you ever get to where you think you found some of it, it's hard to keep. Yeah. We always go from one extreme to the other. Yeah. What happens? People get burnt out on legalism, right? So what do they do? They become liberals. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, both are wrong. Amen. You understand? 
Liberty, that's where it's at. Liberty, not legalism, not li liberalism. Liberty. Liberty is not liberty to sin. That's right. It's liberty from sin. God's made us free from, God said, you know, those people couldn't do it under the law. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring them under grace so it doesn't matter anymore. They can do whatever they want. That's not what grace is for. Amen. God said, I want you to be righteous. Here's the law to tell you how to be. Can't be under the law. Flesh can't perform. So God brought us under grace to make us righteous. Amen. Okay? And it's, about, it's still the right. The righteousness of God doesn't change dispensationally. Yeah. In, in the sense that God said, well, that was wrong over here, morally speaking, but today, eh, <laughs> it's not how it works, right? Amen. You understand? Amen. The moral truth of God never changes. Amen. And... Uh, you know, for example, with the sodomites, that problem so rampant, and they say, oh, that's Leviticus. That's way back in Leviticus, you know. How, didn't you read Romans 1? Yeah. Didn't Paul say they're worthy of death? Didn't he call it vile affections? God didn't change his mind in the age of grace that all of a sudden now it's not wicked. It's still wicked. Right. Moral truth doesn't change. And so what happens is, folks, we have overcorrection. You know what I mean by that? All right, I'm driving down the road, and there's something in the road, and I, and, and I swerve, and oh, I'm going in the ditch. What do I do? Oh, I come back this way. I overcorrect, and I wind up in the other ditch. We, we try to get out of one ditch. We end up in another ditch. And we're so bad about that, aren't we? Yeah. We are. We all are. We're prone to it. That's the flesh. But... Finding and maintaining the right balance is difficult, but it's very important. But thankfully, the Bible said the Lord is at hand. When he said, let your moderation be known to all men, our testimony is important. We're living out our faith before all men. They need to see some moderation. Yeah. Okay? We can't do it, but the Lord is at hand. That means he's, he's people say, well, that means he's near. At hand is near. He's not just near. He's in us, but his coming is near, thank God. I mean, look, Philippians 3.20, our conversations in heaven, for whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, every day we ought to be looking for that blessed hope. I'm not looking at all the current events to decide the Lord's coming. Uh, no matter what's going on in this world, I'm looking every day for the Lord to come. Yeah. Because his coming is not dependent on current events. Amen. He's coming, and he said to be looking, so we just need to keep looking, and the Lord is at hand. And when he does come, we'll never struggle again <laughs> to live a balanced Christian life because we'll be glorified in his very image. Extremism is not only the danger of being excessive in a bad thing. There's also a very more subtle danger. Listen to me. It's possible... To take a good thing too far. Eating is good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Overeating. Not so good. I know. Um, I told my wife, I said, it's not gluttony unless I start puking. <laughs> as long as I can take a little bit more. And I can keep it down. Perfectly fine. <laughs> No, but seriously, um, have you ever read in Proverbs 25, 16, Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. That's what it says. Thank God it didn't say ice cream, it said honey. There's a difference. <laughs> so we can apply this to our spiritual diet. The word of God is our spiritual food. David said the word of God is sweeter also than the honey in the honeycomb. You say, are you telling me that we can get too filled with the word of God? No, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, we're supposed to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. You can't get too much. People say, oh, you're reading too much Bible. Too much Bible make you crazy, right? You ever heard that? I, th I guess they got that from, was it Festus? Yeah. Oh, much learning doth make thee mad. What does Festus know, man? I mean, come on, Festus? <laughs> Gun smoke. <laughs> I don't know why my mind works that way. I look at the prophet Amos, and I start thinking of cookies. <laughs> Famous Amos. <laughs> Strange. But here's where I'm trying to get. I'm just like, hey, look, it's fine. It's going to be all right. We'll, we'll pull through this thing. 
The Word of God, listen, folks, this is so helpful to me. I needed this. God used this, and I still need it. I have to remind myself of this stuff all the time. The Word of God is not just to be taken in. It's to be worked out. Yeah. You take it in to work it out. And if you're taking in and never work out, you're out of balance. Yeah. You're unhealthy. Where do I, Paul said, work out your own salvation. You can't work for it. It's your salvation. God gives it to you. He wants you to work it out. Work out what he's worked in. You live it out by faith. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6 and 7 gives you the keys to spiritual health. When he said, 1 Timothy 4, verse 6 and 7, um, if, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. Whereunto thou hast attained. you got to attain to it personally. Study and show thyself approved unto God. Personal Bible study. No replacement for it. I'm thankful for Bible teachers. I'm thankful for Bible preachers. There are men that God has used to help me. I acknowledge that. But you, watching videos is not Bible study. That's right. Reading other men's books is not Bible study. You've got to attain to it, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. All right? You get nourished up that you have the strength to work it out, to exercise it out, live godly. Sound doctrine produces godliness. Amen. And if it's not, there's a disconnect somewhere. Yeah. It worketh effectually in them that believe. Amen. So if a man knows it, but he doesn't really believe it, it's not going to be lived out. What we battle with is you got on these three things. Okay, physical health, if you refuse the junk food, and you take in the right food, and then you exercise, you're typically okay. I mean, health-wise, right? But who does that? <laughs> That's difficult. So we'd just rather go get a surgery or something, you know. Just do anything, but don't make me stop eating what I like, you know. But spiritual, it's a consistent, and you can't just do it. See, I'm, I'm the king of every Monday. All right, I'm on a diet. Monday night, it just... <laughs> but... You know, we, we have to do it daily, daily, physically. Right. Spiritually, it's the same thing. You've got to refuse false doctrine because false doctrine produces ungodliness. Yeah. All right, if you take it in. So you refuse false doctrine, you believe sound doctrine, and then you exercise in godliness. Now, what happens? you got the people. you got the people. All they want to do is exercise. They want to go, 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 do, do, do. They don't care about learning anything. I just want to do this and do that. And churches are so busy with all the going and doing and the activity, but they don't have the strength to do it without the nourishment. Yeah. Then you got the people, all they want to do is sit around at the Bible buffet and get fat and sassy and get nourished up, nourished up, and do nothing with it. And then you got the people, all they want to do is call out old wives' fables. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. That's wrong. Yeah, you got to have that. The balance, though, is that you refuse the wrong, you nourish up in the good, and then you live it out. All three are important if you're going to be healthy. And if you're missing one of those, you're out of balance. You're not in health. And the fact is, knowledge puffeth up. Yeah. Charity edifies. Paul said, if I knew, if you had faith to move mountains, if you knew all the mysteries, you have charity. If you have not charity, you're nothing. Amen. You're a tinkling symbol. You're a noise. That charity, is it's the Holy Ghost producing that love of God in you and through you. That'll keep you going day after day. We've got to get it from God. It's not of the flesh, it's of the Spirit. So, folks, when we study the Bible, it's not just that we study the Bible. We've got to study it with the right heart. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Amen. Amen. It's, uh, the Bible is a revelation of God. You know why I study the Bible? Because I want to know God. Amen, Dave. I want to know God. I want to walk with God. I want God to change my life. Amen. And I've not apprehended, but I'm not what I was. And let me just park here for just one second on this stuff of people today actually ridiculing, saying that the Word of God ought to change your life. Have you read the Bible? Yeah. What did it do for Saul of Tarsus? Saul said, well, I'm glad I got saved. I'm going to go kill another Christian. 
I'm going to heaven. It changes you. Doesn't Amen. the Word of God change you? Yeah. You're saved by grace. I understand that. But once you're saved, you're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, right? Amen. God's going to work in you. God's going to change you. And so what happens is, folks, we study to know God spiritually in a real relationship that we might know Him and His will, that we might serve Him in a way that pleases Him. And when I die, to be honest with you, I don't want people to say, He was a right division guy. I want people to say He was saved, loved God, served God. Right division is a means to an end. Yes. It is not the end. Amen. You understand that? Amen. We get so hung up sometimes on the mechanics of Bible study, we forget why we're even studying the Bible. Yeah. We get so enamored with learning some new thing about rightly dividing, and it's good to learn. I'm not knocking that, but what I'm saying is why are you learning? Is it possible to study with the wrong motive? Paul said, there are men preaching Christ not sincerely. They're preaching him of envy and strife. Yeah. And I believe, and I've been guilty of this, and I don't want to be, but there are men who study that Bible, and they get motivated by, I want to know more than everybody. Yeah. And then I'm going to, and if anybody, if I think, I see a guy who thinks, he, he sounds like he knows something I don't know. And I start envying him, and I start having strife. And what happens is these right division guys start attacking one another, calling each other heretics, because God forbid somebody actually have a ministry where people can get a blessing from them and not just you. Yeah. That's right. We get threatened. But it's the same junk everywhere else, man. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to be in a group. You don't have to be in a movement. You just need to be in the body of Christ and find a good local church and serve God. Amen. This envy and strife, man, that's all carnal garbage. And we got to watch that thing because it's very easy to fall into that. <laughs> you know, when I was listening to Paul preach last night, I was thinking, man, that's a tremendous message. And I, re I rejoice. I said, I'm so glad he's doing that. Yeah. I said, who does he think he is? I was teaching right the vision before he knew what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But I, I've been, and then that, look, I, I, I get very little upset about it, honestly. I'm not bitter. But people have attacked me simply because, I don't know if they feel threatened a little bit or something. You know, preachers are some of the biggest babies with the biggest egos. Yeah. It's ridiculous. All that's introduction. Now are you ready for the message? <laughs> I'll just briefly say some things. I'm going to, what time should I stop, Pastor? Whatever time you want to. All right. I, I apologize. <laughs> I meant to get through that quicker. But I just want to give you a couple things to leave with you, okay? Here it is, practical hyperdisposition. I'll just give you these. I mean, you could do a whole series just on this. I'm not going to do that because there's other things I want to get to this Why week. Huh? <laughs> Why do, I can't, I'm not even a dispensationalist if I don't write it on the board. I'm joking. Right? <laughs> That's how you know you're in a right division church. Right? You see this? You put this here. You got this here, here, here. <laughs> I can do all that. It's good. It's helpful. I'm not knocking that. I like that. Oh, it's all good. I can't write all this. I can't. I'm not like. Well, the thing about it, though, is guys like Peter Ruckman would draw a dadgum picture while he was preaching. And say, how, how can you do that? I can't even walk and chew gum at the same time. How are you going to draw a picture whenever? It's like if I'm doing something at home, my wife comes up try. I said, don't talk to me. I'm doing something. I can't hear what you're saying. I can't focus on what you're telling me. I'm doing this. But my wife could be on the phone. She could be ironing. She could be making supper. She'd, what is it with you ladies, man? Anyway, all right. This, it'd be all right. Sometimes my wife says, you know, you think you're funny, but you're, sometimes people don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> She's a real help to me in, the, in these matters. But, uh, well, a lot of times, seriously, though, she says, you know, and she knew I was kidding because she knows me, but I'll say something, and I know I'm kidding, and she knows I'm kidding, but nobody else knew I was kidding. And that's the trouble. So we are guilty. Let me just give them to you, okay? We're guilty of hyper-dispensationalism in our walk when we neglect the Scripture that's not written to us. You know what we say? The whole Bible's for us. It's just not all written to us, and that's true. But what happens is every dispensational teacher, including Charles Welch, would say, 
You can make application throughout the Bible. Yeah. But but then when you start trying to, people are, what's wrong with this guy? I thought he was right division. Yeah. What's he doing in the Psalms? Right? <laughs> you preach a message out of Psalms and just make an application about the Christian walk, people think you've lost your mind, you've left the faith. Yeah. Paul said if you're spiritual, you sing Psalms. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking yourself in Psalms. Which ones do you think he was talking about? Maybe the ones in the Bible? You think that might be possible? Yeah. You know what he said? Listen. I'm getting ahead of myself. We understand Paul was given a distinct revelation. In fact, an abundance of revelation. We understand he had a distinct message of ministry that must be emphasized. I'm not saying don't emphasize. You got, that needs to be emphasized. No doubt about it. But what can happen is you can take a good thing too far and you can say the only thing I'm going to talk about is right division. There is more in the Bible than right division. Yeah. There is moral truth that never changes. Yeah. There is practical things. There is all kinds of things in the Bible that doesn't change, right? You understand the difference? In other words, dispensational truth changes progressively as God reveals more. But there are things that run like a straight line. And there is doctrine in the whole Bible that we need in this age to be grounded. And when someone says the only doctrine I need is in Paul's epistles, that's simply not true according to the Word of God. In fact, that's not even true according to Paul. Yeah. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine. Yeah. Did he say all Scripture is yeah. profitable for doctrine? Amen. Right. He did. There's no way around it. Virgin birth, is that, is that profitable to learn about? Is that not crucial? You don't have a Savior if there's not a virgin birth. Amen. Where did Paul talk about it? He implied it, made of a woman. Yeah. He didn't state it, didn't need to, it was already established in the Word of God. Right. There are guys like Charles Welch who say, there is no hell, Paul never mentioned it. Yeah. Right. He didn't have to. It was pretty strongly established before he showed up. Amen. He did describe it in 2 Thessalonians 1, didn't he? Yeah. Everlasting destruction. Yeah. So be careful with that stuff. <clears throat> the fact is, we need to recognize Paul's divinely appointed pattern spokesman in this age. Very important to emphasize that. Romans through Philemon, directly to us. But yet, the whole Bible is the word of God. And if all we needed in this age was Romans to Philemon, that's all God would have preserved. Mm. He preserved the whole book. Amen. Right? Every word of God is pure. Yes, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. i got to have the whole thing. Yeah. Now, Paul's example in this matter is he said, look, how many, and I encourage you, I challenge you, I want you to find all of the, uh, the quotes and allusions back to the Old Testament in Paul's epistle. See how many there are. Mm. There's more than a couple. And he said things written four times written for our learning. Yeah. Romans 15, 4. For our comfort, right? Um, he said it's written for our admonition, 1 Corinthians 10. He told those carnal Corinthians, you're acting just like Israel in the wilderness. You know what? God wasn't pleased with them. He's not pleased with you either. Amen. He said they were, they were a fivefold blessed. Coming through that Red Sea, spiritual meat, spiritual drink, all those things. He said, but there was a fivefold sin in the children of Israel, and they were overthrown. And he said, now you need to learn a lesson from that. Yeah, you're in the body of Christ. Yeah, you're blessed. But you can mess up your life right now. You can still get messed up in this life. You reap what you sow. You better take heed lest you fall. Amen. I mean, it's right there. Isn't it? Amen. Practical. Practical. And you look at those five sins in the children of Israel in the wilderness, it was going on in the church of Corinth because there's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, right? That's the context in which he made that statement. Yeah. You can study that passage. You get a lot out of that. Well, you know what? People say, well, he said that in Romans and 1 Corinthians. That was written during the Acts period. <laughs> now, that's true. He also said all scriptures given by inspiration of God in his last epistle. <laughs> and it's profitable. It's all profitable. In Ephesians. You know what he did in Ephesians? If he, in Ephesians, I already mentioned he, he said sing songs, but also he said, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now this is to you, young people. You listen to me, you young people. 
<laughs> but seriously, though, he said, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. He said, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Yeah. What? Yeah. The Ten Commandments? Yeah. Paul Amen. happened to teach nine of them. He, we're not under the Sabbath, but we're, the other nine still apply. I've heard dispensationalists mock the Ten Commandments. You're a fool. Yeah. Amen. That's the holy word of God. Holy word of God. I would never take the Ten Commandments lightly. No. Come on, folks. Listen. He said, if you will, he told children in the age of grace, if you will honor your mother and father, it will be well with you. He applied the promise to the body of Christ. Amen. Did Paul do it or not? Amen. Amen. And, then, and then he said, he knew what he was talking about too. He didn't have a momentary relapse back to the law. He knew what he was doing because then he said, you'll live long on the earth, not the land, because we don't have the land of Israel, but we're living on the earth. Yeah. See how he applied it? And folks, it goes on and on like that in Paul's epistles. And so what I'm saying is all dispensationalists at least give lip service. They will say all scriptures for us. We can make application. But in practice, if they won't make applications, if a preacher refuses to make spiritual applications like Paul himself did, if all they talk about is dispensational truth, they are acting like a hyper-dispensational. They are going beyond healthy balance. God gave us the whole book for a reason. And by the way, I get more out of the whole Bible through right division. Yeah. I understand it more. And you've got to know how to make the right application. You can make a wrong application if you don't rightly divide the word of truth. But you know what Paul said? Now to him there's a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. We know the verse, don't we? Romans 16. Now to him there's a power to establish according to my gospel the preaching of Jesus Christ according to Revelation the mystery kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. And don't forget that scriptures of the prophets. What they say though is they said that's talking about Paul's writings. Yeah. You heard that? Yeah, I've heard That's that. Paul's writings. Oh, Paul was, what was he, a schizophrenic? The scriptures <laughs> of the prophets? <laughs> I might be misquoting that. I may be wrong. Did he say prophets, plural? Yeah. 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 So Paul's, Paul said, I am prophets. <laughs> All right, that's enough. You know how simple this is? You know how simple this is? Here's how simple it is. I had a guy say, how can I know what to apply and what not to? This is so confusing. I said, here's what you do. Consider what I say. The Lord give the understanding in all things, right? That's what Paul said. So you know what Paul said to you, right? So when you're in the rest of the Bible, if what you're reading lines up with what Paul said to you, apply it. Amen. If it doesn't, rightly divide it. Amen. That's not difficult. Amen. And what you're going to find out, there's a whole lot in the rest of the Bible that does line up with what Paul said. Amen. And, and when you look at dispensations, this concept that they are cut and dried time periods, totally disjointed from one another, is not biblical. The dispensations build on one another, and when God brings in a new dispensation, He does not say everything from the past is now null and void. Amen. The things that change, He says they change. If God didn't say they change, you better leave it there. Amen. We got people, man, they want to rightly divide error. We're going to rightly divide marriage now. We're going to rightly divide all kinds of things that, would, that are moral constants. You understand? Yeah. Number two, <laughs> I'm almost done. I can feel it. And you know what? I actually just looked at the clock, and I'm still under an hour, so we're doing good, man. Yeah. Doing it last, The first message I preached last year, what was it? I don't even know. It was like an hour and a half or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Hour and 35, I think. It was good. No, it wasn't, man. Come on, man. <laughs> I love that it. was your part in it, man. You got up before and after me, and that's what made it an iron. Don't, don't tell no story on me now. I like the interaction. It's all right. It's fine. I enjoy it, you know. Just don't, just don't get me off track here. 
Neglect, because we'll never get out of here if you do. Neglect, if you neglect the scripture not written to you, you need to emphasize Paul's epistles, but you always need to not just say it's all for us. You need to actually believe that, read it all, study it all, apply what you can. There are moral applications all through there. And check Paul's epistles. Follow Paul's example. I don't care what Dr. Snodgrass does, okay, up north where all the real dispensationalists are, right? I mean, down south, we, you know, we're all right. You got a rift. In the grace movement, that's like a north and south thing, you know. We all know. Look, Paul was of the southern tribe of Benjamin. How did he get around that? <laughs> he said, I reckon. Yeah. He didn't say, you guys. You know? He said, y'all. <laughs> y'all, and it's pl plural, is y'allses. <laughs> all right, what am I talking about now? So... You know, check what Paul did on the thing. That's all I'm saying. Don't take my word for it. Check what Paul did on applying other scriptures. All right. So the second thing is if you can't fellowship with someone who doesn't understand everything you think you do, right? You know what? There are people who glory in the truth of the one body, the one body, the church of the one body, one body, one body, one, one body of Christ, one body. And they'll talk it up, talk it up, and they can't get along with anybody. They can't go to a local church. And then they have the audacity to come up with this garbage thing that I don't need a local church because I'm in the body of Christ. If you don't have one, we understand. And, we're, and that's tough, isn't it? Yeah. Folks sitting right here know exactly what I'm talking about. I feel for people like that. There are people who would love to be in a local church, but then you've got people who live right next to it and don't go to it. Right, that's right. The local, Paul gave his life to start local churches. He wrote epistles to local churches. It doesn't have to be either or. It's both. You get in the body of Christ when you get saved. You ought to get in the local church to serve God with other believers. Because the local church is the laboratory in which you work out your faith that you say you believe. Amen. You talk about the body of Christ and you can't show long-suffering. You talk about we're in one body and you can't have compassion on a member of another body, uh, 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 another member of the body. I mean, folks, we got to live out the faith. we got to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called. But what happens is, is we talk about the one body, but then Christians who are not as enlightened as we think we are, we act like they're second-class members of the body of Christ. And they say, well, I'm a grace believer. i got news for you. If everybody who's saved is a grace believer, yeah. how'd they get saved? <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, we do the same thing. We start labeling ourselves and pushing off other people. And, and we really don't work as hard as we pretend to to bring them over and show them. If we would, look, there are going to be people. You don't have to tell me. There are going to be people who reject it and fight it. And I understand that. And you've got to take a stand. But sometimes we're just too high and mighty in what we think we know to take the time to really try to help someone see it. Yeah. But if you don't see it in one second, I'm moving on, brother. You know, to serve the Lord must be patient yeah, and meekness That's right. struck, instructing those that oppose themselves. And so we've got to learn to fellowship, and we've got to learn what the basis is. But, you know, isn't it ironic that there are so many cliques in the grace movement? The, the grace movement is supposed to stand for the church of the one body of Christ, right? Yeah. One body of Christ. And, the, and, then, and then we say, well, I am of Stan. Yeah. I am of Richard Jordan. I am of Les Feldick. Yeah. You know? I am of uh, E.C. Moore. You know? And everybody gets all splintered out in their little cliques. That's right. That's like the church at Corinth. I am of Paul. I am of Paul. Rebuke that. Amen. That's carnal. Those who lament the error of denominationalism are too often denominational in their attitude and their conduct. They lament it in their doctrine, but they practice it in their walk. Yeah. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. In the grace movement. The Amen. biggest problem with the grace movement is the grace movement. Hypocrisy. Amen. I, this one lady, you remember this, Stephen. Remember when that uh, pastor in Florida told us about the lady who visited his church and she left a grace church to go to a Baptist church, which was also very dispensational, but she said, you know, there wasn't much grace in the grace church. <laughs> if you don't dot every I, cross every T, and believe everything I believe. Alright? Right. That's right, Dave. 
Me and Paul agree on a lot, but we don't agree on everything. But we know what the basis of fellowship is. Yeah. So would you recommend somebody going to just a regular Christian church if there's no mid-axis dispensational church in their area? Or? What I recommend is that people try to work with other people and have felt, and if people are receiving the light, give them more light. Obviously, if people are rejecting it, you know, there comes a point where you can't practically work together if you're in disagreement on some important things. What I'm talking about right now, though, I'm not talking about major things. I'm talking about within the grace movement itself when we nitpick each other over very technical stuff in the book of Acts. You know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about that. That's another. That's a good question, but that's another question for another time. What I'm talking about right now is within circles that believe like what we do, you've got people who can't fellowship with other people if they don't have their peculiar pet doctrines. That's right. You know, you got one group says, I believe in two sendings of Paul. And they have this, this idea about the book of Acts that they hold to, and they literally... It's like, that's the thing. Do you believe that? Well, what's wrong with you? I'm not going to... And, and that's not an issue of fellowship. Yeah. I Look, the basis of fellowship is Ephesians 4, right? Mm -hmm. Seven ones. Yeah. The unity of the Spirit. Here's the thing, folks. God made the unity of the Spirit. we got to endeavor to keep it because it doesn't come easy. We got God made the unity of the Spirit in our state. we got to keep it in our walk. And it, it, it's going to take, he said, you know what he said? Look, go ahead and look at it. We're almost done, I promise. I'm sorry I've gone long, but what, what, do, you, what do you want? You know? Can't do nothing about it now. I mean, it is what it is at this point. <laughs> Why are we such slaves to the clock? I fight that all the time, though. I, I'm, a, I'm like the worst one about that. I'm always thinking, i got to hurry. i got to Why? Yeah. What are you going to do? Everything's closed anyway. <laughs> at least you don't have to wear a mask in here. Ephesians chapter 4, I know, well, you folks back there, you got a long drive, I'll get you out of here. Plus, we do want to go get some ice cream after this, we've got to keep that in mind. <laughs> now let's hurry. Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you walk worthy of vocation worth your call, with what? All lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. How about that? The high calling demands a lowly walk. Amen. What do we got to brag about? We are what we are by the grace of God. Endeavoring to keep you in the spirit and the bond of peace. One body. There's one body, one spirit. Even as you call one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Is above all, through all, and in you all. That is it. You could fellowship on that basis. And you've got to have discernment to know how to carry this out. But what I'm telling you is there are people that break fellowship over things not on this list. That's what I'm talking about. They, what happens is, folks, we get puffed up and then we start nitpicking everything we hear. Yeah. And we can't get a blessing out of anybody's preaching anymore. You know? Well, and, then, and, then, and they'll say, you got for an example, I mentioned Ruckman earlier, you know, and people say, he wasn't even right division. I mm. learned a heck of a lot about right division from Peter S. Ruckman. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Right? Okay, yeah, he didn't go follow it all the way through to where we have, but you know what? He's going to give an account to God, not us. And you know what? Be thankful for the good things you did learn. Don't get up and slander the guy and act like he didn't know what a dispensation was. That's yeah. right. There's this jaybird on YouTube talking about Ruckman wasn't even a dispensation, just trashing the guy. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll see. Yeah. Won't we? Let's, let's judge it then. Here's the thing. He's going to make manifest the counsels of the heart. He's going to try every man's work. Why are we trying to judge one another's ministry down here? We're not, we don't have the ability or the authority to judge one another's ministry right now. That's right. Let the Lord sort it out, the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. I had one guy try to tell me, you support a Baptist, I support Baptist missionaries. Can I confess that? Hi, my name is David Osteen. <laughs> I still support Baptist mis uh, missionaries. <laughs> Confess your faults one to another. Right? But I actually had a guy say, well, now that you've come to see the mystery. Like, first of all, I've, I've, I've saw it for a while now, actually. It's not just because I'm talking to you at this point. <laughs> but 
Well, if you, if you really are, then you're going to have to drop him. I said, i tell you what. I said, when you start taking the gospel to the world, I'll support you. Yeah, that's right. But until then, see, this guy over here that calls himself a Baptist, he knows how to rightly divide. He, yeah, we disagree on some things, yes. But he does preach Paul's gospel. He does understand the body of Christ and a lot of wonderful things. Plus, he actually follows Paul in that he carries the gospel to people who haven't heard it. Yeah. So he's more Pauline than you. That's right. Amen. You see what I'm saying? J.C. O'Hare, one of the founding fathers of what they call the Grace Movement in America, supported Baptist missionaries because they got the job done. Amen. People don't know their history, man. You got pseudo dispensationalists today. They're nothing like Bullinger. They're nothing like O'Hare. They're nothing like Stan as far as maturity is concerned. And I know, and by the way, he said, well, I don't know if Brother Lucas would agree. He does, because we already talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me to say it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lastly, and I conclude, I conclude. I'm kind of venting a little bit, you know what I'm saying? And I need this, because I, I fight this stuff. I'm preaching to myself more than anybody. I'm preaching to myself more than anybody. I get the big head sometimes, you know. Think I know something. Then God reminds me, you know nothing. Yeah. You pipsqueak. You better stay on your face and study my word, and I might show you some more. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm sorry, I forgot God would never rebuke a member of the body of Christ, would he? <laughs> Lastly, we are hyper dispensationalists in how we act when we ignore the application of the doctrine we talk so much about. Yeah, amen. You know, we're not under the law, we're under grace. That's exactly right. Praise God for that. That's why sin shall not have dominion over you. That's right. But you know what? It is, being under grace is not a doctrinal statement. It's a spiritual reality that ought to change the way we live. Let me give you this one last thing. If you would, please, Romans 6, and we'll finish there. And I, I do, I, I am trying to close this thing. There's a lot, really. I should have could probably made this three messages this week, but there's some other things I really feel like we, need, we should look at. And So, uh, Romans 6, verse 14. <clears throat> for sin shall not have dominion over you, for not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Past tense. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Spirit, soul, and body. Paul said, give yourself wholly to these things. W-H-O-L-L-Y. He said, I pray God your whole spirit and uh, soul and body be preserved blameless. Spirit, soul, and body, no reckon and yield. No, you're dead with Christ, crucified, buried, risen with Christ, baptized. You know the chapter of Romans 6. You're crucified. You've got to know that doctrine. You've got to reckon it in your heart. And then you've got to yield the members of your body to live it out. Spirit, soul, body. You know the doctrine in your spirit. You believe it with all your heart. You live it out through your body. A man is three parts. The three parts are distinct, but they're related. Where is the disconnect between the spirit, soul, and body? you got people that claim to know doctrine and it never makes it down in their heart. Yeah. And because it doesn't make it down in their heart, they never live it out in their life. What they know is what someone else told them. Regurgitated food just ain't going to get the job done. Somebody else already studied and, and wept over it and, and worked on it, gets up and delivers it to you. That already went through their system. It's got to get in yours. You got to take it and study it. Yeah. You got to get it in your own heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Yeah. The heart. You can hide it in your mind all day long. When's <laughs> it going to get there? The spirit, not just brain activity, I'm talking about spiritual knowledge through your heart, out your body. The fact of the matter is, folks, whenever Paul laid a doctrinal foundation, what did he do? He always followed it up with practical application. Always. Yeah. Don't take my word for it. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Doctrine, body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Walk. Yeah. War. Live it out. He does it again and again. 
The grace, look, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us yeah. that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Amen. Amen. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us unto himself, a peculiar people. Redeem us from iniquity unto himself, a peculiar people, zealous of good doctrine. You need that. You've got to start there, but you can't stop there. He said good works. And so, my friend, if you think preaching biblical separation from this evil world, if you think godliness, if you think practical Christian living is legalism, you're a hyper dispensation. You know what? Paul and I have talked about this. I'm so thankful to God for showing me the grace message because I was under legalism struggling greatly to try to find out how to perform yeah. it. Yeah. And I could not. Amen. And then when God showed me the truth of the body of Christ that I'm already complete in Him, accepted in the Beloved, and who I am in Him, and that all I need to do is, as I've received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. It's His life through me. It's not my performance. It's not my flesh. It's Christ. As I saw that, the thankfulness that now not only do I know what's right, by the grace of God, I can do what's right. Amen. Right division did not free me from responsibility to live for God. It showed me how. Amen. It Amen. showed me how. I didn't say, bless God, I'm under grace, so forget this. I'm not under the tithe. What are you, a leader? I'm not giving nothing. That's what people do. Right. Yeah, you're not under the tithe. The man, at least you can do is 10%. Good night. <laughs> you ought to do more under grace than I ever thought about under the law. Amen. 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 That's right. Yeah. If our church, you know what, you know, our church doesn't tithe, and I'm glad because there are people that I know do, do more than tithing. And that's how we're able to do what we do. And you know what happens? Overcorrection. Because the religious world abuses tithing and they misteach it. They don't know what tithing is anyway. They don't teach it according to the law. But they abuse it. So what do we do? We swing to the other thing and act like if you talk about money at all, then you're just some kind of religious man. And, you, and that's why Grace Movement can't get anything done. Because I hate to tell you, it still takes money to operate in this world. That's right. <laughs> and if anybody ought to be givers, it ought to be people under grace. Amen. Paul said, you know what? Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. In the context of giving, if God is the greatest giver and he lives in you, don't you think you ought to be given? Yeah. It's not just money. It's a lot of things. But money is in there. Check Paul on the matter. And so I'm saying, you know what? He, you know, this thing of, I, I fear, I fear that sometimes we say, well, okay, I'm not under the law. Now I don't have to do much. And nobody would say that, but that's how they act. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. What did the grace of God do to Paul? Amen. It didn't cause him to sit on his rear end. Amen. He labored more abundantly even than the people that had been under the law. Because now he has the power to do it. Now he has the motive to do it. Now it's right. You see what I'm saying? Amen. That's what it does. That's what it does. You know, Paul said that we need to follow him. And it's not just in his doctrine. We need to follow the doctrine Christ revealed through him. But he said, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. Yeah. And the God of peace shall be with you. And so what I want to do is I'm not looking to Richard Jordan. I'm sorry. I'm sure he's a great man. I've met him. He's a nice guy. I don't have no problem with Richard Jordan. But I'm just saying, I'm not looking to Richard Jordan. I'm not looking to E.C. Moore. Uh, he's already in heaven. I'm not looking to Les Feldick. Seems like a real nice fellow. I mean, how can you not like Les Feldick? I mean, good night, the nicest man in the world. All right? I wish we all were more like old Les, you know? I always think, man, I wish I could do that. Nobody ever gets offended at Les. <laughs> but he's just got that thing, man. He's just got that, you know? Well, I don't have that. 
but I'm not looking, and I'm, I appreciate these men. Don't misunderstand me. But what I'm saying is I want to look to God, and then I want to follow the example he gave me in Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Paul didn't neglect the rest of the scripture. Amen. And Paul fellowshiped with Peter. <laughs> did, he, I'm, did he not? Yeah. Did Paul not fellowship with Peter? Did they not give him the right hands of fellowship? Amen. Had the same ministry. He could still fellowship on the things they did they did have in common. Folks, we act like when we get to heaven, if we happen to walk past a Jew, I'm in the body. <laughs> You're of Israel. Sorry. Sorry. Right? That's right. That's a good point. If it's for Israel, it can't be for I heard a guy say, I'm not in the book of life. Because the book of life is related to Israel and the book of Revelation. I said, man, well, I'm going to start praying for this guy to get saved, man. Yeah. If you're not in the book of life, you don't have eternal life. It's all right. You agree with me, don't you? I don't care if you do or not. I'm going to say it anyway. The Bible, the book of life is eternal life in Christ. And we're going to say because it's in the book of Revelation, we can't be in that book. There is a difference. You get blotted out in the tribulation. If you take the mark, we're not under that. We're still in the, we're still in the book of life where God puts the names of people who have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. And let me, let me really mess up your apple cart. I love doing this. We need it. We need it because we get a system. We get a system and we think we got it all figured out. But every time you think you got everything figured out, God has a monkey wrench in there. Amen. Amen. When you die and go to heaven, if you believe that, I hope you do. Some don't. They think they're going to sleep in the dirt. How does that gain? To live as Christ and die as gain. I'm going to heaven. That's gain over. <laughs> When you go to heaven, are you going to flip around just celestially? Or are you going to be at the throne of God worshiping God? Where is the throne of God? Is it in the New Jerusalem, Paul? It's where it is, where place is where we want. Is there a city up there right now? Yeah. So when you die and go to heaven, you're going to be outside the city? That's a bad thing to say because Revelation says without our dogs. I'm going to be in the city when I die. I'm going to see the streets of gold, the gates of pearl, and I'm going to see it, and I'm going to fish in the river of life. <laughs> no, look, I understand the new Jerusalem. You don't have to tell me. Everybody's going to send me emails, you know. They, I doubt they made it this far. And you may not even put this online. But if they send me the emails, try, I know about the new Jerusalem, but what I'm telling you is this. We get access to it also. It is the new Jerusalem. It's got the 12 tribes on it. All things are gathered together in Christ. We have fellowship in eternity with the whole family in heaven and earth. Amen. <laughs> Folks, man, we get carried away. Yeah. We go excessive. And if, you, if you've been studying right division any length of time, if you're honest, you needed this. Because I did. I know I did. I've done all this stuff I'm preaching about. That's why I'm, I'm not up here acting like I got it all figured out. And I'm, I'm preaching this because I need it. The biggest problem, like I said, Paul said, uh, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. He said, you ought to live in such a way that's suitable for what you're telling people you believe. And when people look at us and they see no difference, they say, why do I need what they got? Yeah. Right? I, I did been a little bit. That's not because I'm mad at anybody. I get aggravated with myself for falling into this stuff because it's so carnal, isn't it? Yeah. But man, that old flesh, it just won't leave you alone, will it? <laughs> uh, but I want to I wanna reckon it dead. I want to walk in the Spirit. I want admonition. I want. You can't get the average grace conference. You will never get rebuked for anything. Yeah. Never. Will you? Uh, I've never... I, They'd call you legal if you go that route. Yeah. We need it, folks, because we've not apprehended. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I need that. Let, <laughs> we all do. We all do. Let your moderation be known to all men. Yeah. The Lord's at hand. Amen. Father, I thank you for the privilege to stand and preach the word, no matter how poorly we do it at times. We know the word of God is the power, and as long as we give it out, you can use it in spite of us, certainly not because of us. So please take these scriptures we looked at tonight. Help me to receive what we saw in the word. Help us all to receive it. And please help us in the next couple days to uh, be able to come together and
and receive more from your word. And, and Father, if you come tonight, that's perfectly fine. Also, we're looking for that. We thank you for all we have in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.